Thank you, Alexei, for introducing us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at the great Joker conference and talk about Java code coverage. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, I'm working on code coverage tool for the JVM since more than a decade. And I'm here together with Evgeny. Evgeny jumped in very early in these open source projects. And nowadays, he is also a project lead at the Eclipse Foundation for our code coverage tool for the Eclipse IDE. So, hello, everybody. Before we start, uh, usual disclaimer that whatever we say here is not connected with our employees. They can only dream that they own our opinions. Um, to start, maybe, Mark, you can tell us uh, a bit of a history. Ah. Also, Sorry. the question first is, uh, what is the talk about, Evgeny? Yeah, it's a pretty good question. Uh, and let me ask this question from the audience. Uh, who came here to learn something about how to use uh, code coverage? Anyone? Oh, good. good. Uh, quite a few people. Um, sorry for you. We are not going to talk uh, about how to use code coverage. We are going to talk about something different. Who came here to learn something about, uh, no, sorry. Who is already knows what Jaco Colibri is and using it? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. And who is here to learn something new about Java? Probably a good news for you. We hopefully will learn something new. And to be more precise and specific, we are going to talk about mechanics. We are going to talk about how to do code coverage measurement in Java. And before we start, here is a real disclaimer. Uh, we will look a little bit inside of GVM and uh, into some blood coming out of uh, internals of GVM. Um, we will talk a little bit about bytecode, uh, strong language, be prepared, and sorry for that. Uh, we will try within half of an hour to do some violence for your brains against, for your brain, again, sorry for that. And be warned, we are going to look, of course, on implementation details, and dragons are here. Uh, either use it with real care or don't use it at all. And before we proceed into internals, maybe you, Mark, can tell us a bit of a history, how all all started for you, how you... I was actually a long time ago, like more than 10 years ago, um, I was working on a project where we tried to apply test-driven development practices and also create code coverage reports um, for our products. Um, at that time, the only tool available was the Emma code coverage library, which was a nice tool, and we integrated it into uh, uh, our builds. But in the end, the cycle, the feedback cycle for the developers was simply too long to wait for the build and then open some Jenkins page or a cruise control at the time, if I remember correctly, um, and look at the reports. So I wanted to have it directly in the IDE, so available for the developers. And this leads me to um, creating the Eclipse plugin Eclamor, which basically um, brings Emma directly into the Eclipse IDE. And this short feedback cycle actually was adopted very quickly by the community. So this was open source from the very beginning. So we retrieved uh, community awards in 2007, 2008, just one year after release. And this tool was widely used. But we had a problem. So the Emma library, um, there was a single release only. And back in 2005, and it was never updated afterwards, so it disappeared. And in the meantime, we have seen new Java versions, Java 6, Java 7. Um, and we wanted to have new features, like not just instruction coverage, maybe also branch coverage, new coverage metrics, uh, maybe complexity, whatever. So I was looking for an alternative, so alternative code coverage library. And this um, finally leads me to a new project, um, Chacoco, the Java code coverage tool. Uh, which I started about end of 2009. And this is now also the backend of the Clamor plugin. And in the meantime, the Clamor plugin, um, I don't want to install it anytime I download a new Eclipse. That's why we transferred the project to the Eclipse Foundation, where Evgeny is a project lead. And now the code covers is part of, um, directly part of Eclipse. But uh, now gets, let's go to the technical details. Yeah, okay. Let's go into the technical details. And before we go into the technical details, um, let's recall such a term from a physics as observer effect. Uh, putting it simply, 
uh, it is a statement that any measurement, any instrumentation, uh, anyway alters the state of what is measured. And this is quite important to remember uh, when we are talking about code coverage, because code coverage is a measurement. So, so anyway, it will be affecting somehow your application. It will be affecting uh, performance. And the goal of a good code coverage library is to minimize as much as possible this impact on your application. So could you tell us, Mark, uh, how we try to achieve uh, this goal? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's different options. Um, first of all, code coverage is a dynamic metric. It's not like that we statically look at the code or the tests. Uh, we need to execute the test. It could be unit test, it could be integration test, whatever. You test, you execute a piece of code, and you observe what has been executed. And there's different way to implement this. You can do it directly on the JVM le level. Um, we call it runtime profiling. Uh, there are profiling APIs. There's the old JVM profiling interface. It's is deprecated since, some, since quite some time. And then there's nowadays the JVM tooling interface, which is primarily used by debuggers. Uh, but yes, if you can imagine, like, um, if you want to record the execution of every instruction, every line and every branch using like a debugger interface, um, adds a lot, of inter um, a lot of overhead to it. And the performance is like really bad using this uh, interfaces in this way. So we, you need to um, do a different approach, and this approach is called instrumentation. So here the idea is that you actually modify the application under test to record which part of the application has been executed. Here we can cut it in two different layers. So one layer is we can directly could directly use uh, cut in on source level. So we could transform, for example, Java source code and add something like additional, let's say, block statements to see which methods or which lines has been executed. Actually, there are tools around using that. Uh, Clover is uh, from Atlassian is one of the tools. You might have heard that this year the tool has been open sourced. So you can look at it, how it is done, and you can also use it for free. And what we actually do is uh, we follow a different path. Uh, we work directly on the bytecode. The bytecode is a very handy format once you get used to it. And we transform the bytecode to get um, the coverage information. And we have two different approaches here. One approach is uh, to actually physically transform class files or char files before you start your application, uh, run your tests. And the other way is to do it on the fly, like in memory. We will see more about this later. Um, so as I said, Chakoko works on class files only. This is important to understand. So you always start with class files. You have some class files from your application. And these class files get instrumented. This is the process of adding the probes. We will see more about that later. And then the instrumented version of the classes are executed. And the Chakoko runtime, there's a little runtime coming with Chakoko, um, records the data, and we call it execution data, and persist it. There are several options. One option is to store it to a file. And we get these execution data files, which um, has information about the executed probes. So the execution data file is not readable directly. This is some binary format, um, very simple. Uh, to get more semantics out of the execution data files, we need the original class files and do some analysis. Typically, this is the process of report generations. And you get these nice shiny reports where you get the overall statistics and also highlighted source code. Um, to make sure the source code we see here is only injected during um, report generation. So the source code is not parsed at all. It's just line numbers. The line numbers we retrieve from the debug information, from the class files. And the analyzer does not parse the source file or do attach any semantics. It's just line numbers, highlighting of line numbers. It's all based on class files. Yeah, OK. So as Mark said, there is two approaches. One is uh, offline instrumentation, where we change really class files on the disk, and another one, so-called on-the-fly instrumentation. And we, uh, we actually recommend to, to use on-the-fly simply because it's as easy as setting one argument to the, uh, to the GVM uh, minus Java agent, and you specify the Jacoco agent with some options, and then you start your application. It works for. Uh, whatever you want, it works for uh, 
for servers, uh, Tomcat, etc. It works for unit tests. Before launching QA unit test, you, 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 you add this uh, command line argument. Under the hood, uh, this means that uh, agent is going to be executed before your application, before the main entry point of your application. Uh, and this agent will uh, instruct uh, the GVM to use a special class transformer. So each time class is loaded by the GVM, transformer can uh, get a chance to transform the classes, uh, uh, the bytecode of the class. So it's probably Mark time to explain what this transformation is. So the transformation modifies the bytecode, as we said before, and insert probes. And in the end, we want to know the execution status of every line, of every instruction, of every branch. So we could theoretically add like a probe for every instruction, for every branch. And this will cause lots of overhead, lots of overhead. So what we do instead, um, we look at the control flow of the method, of every method. Every method and uh, we don't need, actually, we don't need so many probes. So imagine, for example, you have a very simple method, which is just a um, simple sequence of instructions um, without any branches, without any conditionals in there. Um, you can imagine if we add a probe at the very end of this method, and this probe has been executed, we can easily infer that every other instruction within the method was also executed. And if we go to control structures, it's a bit more complex, but in this case we can see um, just three probes are enough to infer the execution of every single instruction in this control flow and also for the branches. So we try to reduce the number of probes in the class file. This is the first thing. Uh, the next question is how we do actually insert the probes in certain situations. Um, these, are the, uh, these are kind of the primitives we have. For example, if you want to see whether the um, control flow between two instructions are executed, that's simple. You simply insert a probe in the middle, and then you know that this edge was executed. It gets a little bit more tricky. We have some instructions in the JVM which do not return at all. So the control flow of the method terminates, basically the return statement or the throws of code. And here, we need to insert the probe just before the bytecode. Um, we can safely assume that the return statement will be executed afterwards. Um, the same applies, or similar approaches for in the Java bytecode, we have an opcode goto, an unconditional goto. We don't have it in the language, but in the bytecode, there's goto, and it's used a lot, uh, or generated a lot by the compiler. And if you want to have this, uh, want to see this, uh, uh, this edge, whether this edge was executed or not, uh, we can simply, again, uh, insert the probe right before the go-to statement because we can safely assume that the go-to statement is executed. This is completely unconditional. Situation gets more tricky if you talk about conditional jumps or these if opcodes. And if you want to know here whether um, the jump has been executed or not, we need to somehow place the probe on the edge, which is quite a tricky. What we do here is that we actually invert um, the conditional and put the um, probe right after the um, conditional jump and rewire the targets. And so we can, um, without changing the behavior of the application, we can safely insert the probe here. And as Mark said, this is just the primitives. Uh, this is just the basic building blocks. Uh, you can imagine that uh, Java compiler for more complex applications uh, generates various combinations of those. Uh, and so we need quite a good testing of, of all these uh, insertions and modifications of bytecode. Um, and for this, we write so-called uh, validation test suits. Uh, they look pretty much like you can see on a slide. Uh, we have a source code. We marked certain lines uh, in this source code with a special commands so that later on, after compilation and execution of this code, we can make uh, assertions about uh, actual result of code coverage. And that's how we, we do a validation uh, of our library. Of course, we also have uh, other unit tests and et cetera, et cetera. And given the fact that uh, on the market there is uh, quite some 
uh, GDK versions, and they behave differently, both in terms of compilation and uh, in terms of uh, runtime. We test all this on uh, Nova days. We test all this on five major GDK versions, plus Eclipse uh, compiler for Java. Um, and Java 10. Since yeah, and uh, yesterday there is already available Java 10 uh, early access build, so we probably should start testing. And all this allows us to identify issues not only in Jacoco. I would even say we mostly do not identify issues in Jacoco. We identify issues actually in GDK, and we report them back. And apparently it turns out that we are in a top five uh, external contributors, back reporters uh, into OpenGDK, uh, along with such projects as Apache Lucene, IntelliJ IDEA, and so on. And actually, this is not that hard to find a bug in GVM, and uh, it's not that hard to report it back. And we are going to try to show you uh, and try to find uh, some bugs during this presentation. So let's, let's continue. Um, so you explained it, Mark, uh, to us uh, how we try to minimize amount of probes. Maybe now it's time to talk about what prop is. Yeah, and how the probe is actually implemented. Yes, yeah. and please keep in mind that we want to be really fast and have as less as possible right, impact. There's, yeah, there, there's a couple of requirements for the probes. Um, so first of all, the probes should be like really fast. You want to minimize the runtime overhead. Um, second of all, uh, the probes uh, should not affect the application, so it should not have any impact on the logic of the application. Uh, we assume that the application under test can, can be multi-threaded, can be an application server, can be some container. Um, so this must be supported. And then, of course, the basic functionality of the probe is somehow we need to record the execution. This is the basic functionality of the probe. And the second is we need to identify it. So we have, as you've seen before, in the method we have multiple probes and we really need to identify which, which probe is which. And there's a very simple trick to do this. Um, maybe we should ask audience. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. Uh, involved, so involved, do you have any ideas uh, which Java construction satisfies all those requirements? No one? No one. Okay, it's actually as easy as this. Yeah, just we, we use a Boolean array. Uh, we use Boolean arrays for the methods, and we simply set the Boolean array to true. So this is like really minimal overhead. And if we only, we only set to true, we are thread safe within the application. We are never reading it within the application. And um, this can be implemented in bytecode by just uh, four instructions. Um, Who is a bytecode native speaker? Probably you, Mark. OK, I'm the night. So the probably speaker. you should explain okay, a little bit. What's going on here is um, that, first of all, the A is always in bytecode is always an object. Uh, the A prefix is always for object. So we load an object, the, basically the probe um, array. Uh, we push the ID on the operand stack, the ID of, the, of this probe. And then there's a special opcode for like 0, 1, 2, and so on. Uh, we push the probe ID number. Uh, the, the, the true value, the true value, which is uh, I equals one, and then we push, uh, then we store it to the to the array. The A means it's the Boolean array, and we store it to the Boolean array the value. That's it. And depending on the size of the ID, this makes only four bytes in the class. Four additional bytes, or up to seven, depends. The second bytecode here depends on the on the uh, range of the bytecode. There's uh, different options to do this. Um, this, is, this is quite an important point because, you know, uh, everything uh, comes with some limitations and uh, of course there is uh, as a limit on the size of a method within GVM, so it's quite important to have as small as possible prop to not cross this limit on a very big methods. Sure. Um, how to get props, Mark? Uh, that's a good question. So, so I showed you how to set the probes, uh, but at the very beginning of each method, uh, we somehow we need to get a reference to the probe array. So this is like pseudocode here. Um, this is how the bytecode would look like, uh, what, what would result in bytecode. The method, uh, we need the probe array. 
And if you implement such things, such internals, it's always a good thing to look at the Java virtual machine or the JDK and what they do in these situations. And it turned out that there's like a similar thing in Java, which is the Java assertions. Uh, the Java assertions is basically pure language feature. So Java assertions is not something which is directly built in the JVM or partly. And as you might know, you can enable and disable assertion. So there's a minus EA flag for enable assertion. And somehow there's an additional condition. So first of all, we check the X, we can check the condition, but also we have to check whether assertions are enabled or not. And if you want to know how something works, um, what is your friend? The Java deep compiler, of course. So we decompile all the Java disassembler, we disassemble this, and we see that here's the check for the condition. And the interesting point here is how is it decided whether assertion is enabled or not within a class is done with a static field called dollar assertions disabled. This is what the compiler creates in the class files if you actually um, use assertions within your class file. And this is exactly the same trick uh, we use for Chakuko. Uh, we simply use a uh, Boolean. Uh, the Boolean array is a static uh, as constant within the class, and this is where we retrieve See down here, uh, this is where we retrieve the probe array instance. So just to recap, uh, the cost of accessing runtime in case of assertions to check uh, the status, whether they are enabled or disabled, is uh, quite big. So you don't want to do this each time you do an assertion. That's why you put uh, uh, you pre-compute the value and put it into a static final field. And the same thing for us, uh, cost of getting an array is quite huge. So instead of requesting each, each time, we can pre-compute it and put it into a static final uh, field. But wait, Mark, what this synthetic is? Oh, OK, sorry. This is just a pseudocode. So synthetic does not exist, of course, in the Java um, in Java language, so this keyword does simply not exist. But synthetic is a flag, actually, which um, the Java compiler um, emits for certain, in certain situations. And whenever the Java compiler creates something synthetic, something which is not there in the source code, like, we, like we've seen before, um, the assertions um, disabled, we've never seen that. Uh, we've never Oops. seen that um, in the source code, probably. This is created by the compiler. That's why it's marked as synthetic. Oh, OK, now I see. And so we mark uh, our created field as synthetic for the same reason, to denote the construction that doesn't exist uh, right. into the source code. And this is also quite important. Uh, from time to time, we receive, uh, let's say, a pseudo-bug report saying that uh, uh, I had my application. It worked perfectly. I enabled uh, recording of code coverage, and now strange effects uh, a happening, I'm seeing what I'm not supposed to see. And the answer on all this is that probably your application or your library or dependency of your library is using reflection. And during usage of res reflection, you introspect the content of classes and you see this unexpected field. The solution is pretty simple. You should ignore the synthetic members. Never ever rely on synthetic members in case Be you write some. Reflective library. Yes, because as, as you see, even compiler can generate synthetic members. OK, um, while we are here and while we are talking about synthetics, uh, maybe we can remember some other examples of uh, synthetic constructions in Java. Anyone? Someone? Some ideas? Other cases where the compiler kicks in with synthetic stuff? Yes, bridge methods. OK, so what bridge methods is? Um, let's say we have uh, some class. Within this class, we have a private uh, field. Uh, within this class, we also have some inner class. And within inner class, we are doing an access to a private field of an outer class. And while while this is perfectly valid source code, while this is permitted by a Java language specification, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is 
not permitted by uh, Java Virtual Machine specification. Those two classes, uh, basically, one class can't have an access to the private members of another class. So in order to work around uh, this, let's say, difficulty, uh, Java compiler does uh, an interesting trick. And uh, as before, we can see this trick by doing a decompilation. Uh, if we decompile these two classes, we will see a synthetic member uh, method whose name starts with uh, access dollar. Uh, this is so-called bridge method. This bridge method provides an access to another class to the private field of this class. Um, do you have ideas of some other constructions? Oh, why is this important for code coverage, by the way? Is this oh, any yes, for us? It's, it's a pretty good question. Um, this is also important for code coverage because you don't want to see in your report uh, uh, any artifacts like this. You, you don't care about what compiler generated. So uh, during the report generation, we actually should ignore such synthetic members. Um, Speaking about some other examples of synthetic constructions, what about implicit methods in enums, values, and value of? Are they synthetic? Actually, no. Uh, this is a common misbelief that uh, all generated constructions are synthetic. They are not. And the reason for this is, uh, as with reflection, synthetics are ignored by IDEs, libraries, and etc. But those two methods they are part of an API. They should be callable, they, they should be after completable from IDE, and etc. etc. So they are not synthetic. And again, why this is important for code coverage library? Because even though those methods are not synthetic, they are still generated by a compiler. So you, we still should ignore them from the code coverage reports. You, you there is basically no point in testing them, so you will simply uh, trust the compiler that it does his job on, on generation of those methods perfectly. Another example of uh, synthetic constructions in Java is actually how Lambda are implemented. Uh, if, you will, if, if again we will have a look on a bytecode uh, of a class that contains uh, Lambda expression, and this time we will enable printing of line numbers, then we will notice that compiler cr created uh, an interesting uh, synthetic method whose name starts with uh, Lambda dollar, and all the bytecode within this method associated with line numbers of actually Lambda expression. Uh, this is how lambdas are implemented. And this is important, again, for code coverage library, because even though this method is synthetic and compiler generated, we, we oppositely to other examples, we need to uh, show coverage uh, in the report for this method. Otherwise, you wouldn't see a coverage on original uh, lambda expression. Um, this was a tiny warm-up. We hope your brain is ready to enjoy some hardcore. Mark, are you ready? Ready. OK. So let's have a look on the following uh, pretty simple example. Let's say I have a class. Within this class, I have a static initializer. Within static initializer, I create some object, and I call some method on it. Pretty simple, right? OK. Now I have this object which I am created. It's actually a class which extends my first class. And the method implemented within this class which I am calling has an assertion. And assertion is pretty simple. One equal to two. And I am having such an application which simply creates an instance of this second class. So. What are going to happen if assertions enable it and I start this? Pretty obvious. Assertion here. Assertions enable it. One not equal to two. Assertion here. That's correct. What about assertions disabled? Any idea? Mark, what do you think? Yeah, of course. Uh, no, I mean, it's not executed at all because it's disabled, right? Well, let's recall how assertions disabled works. So 
we have a static final synthetic uh, generated construction uh, field assertions disabled. And this field is initialized within a static initializer of a class. So what's going to happen? In order to create an instance of child, we need to initialize a child. In order to initialize a child, we need to initialize a base. In order to initialize a base, we need to execute static initializer of a base class. Static initializer of a base class create again child and calls a method. So actually, within a sequence of initialization of a child, we will already call its method. So we will reach assertion point before initialization happened. So putting it differently, a static initializer of a class is not guaranteed to be the first thing that is executed within this class. As this example shows, you can easily execute some method before the static initializer of a class. Why this is interesting? Because uh, since initialization didn't happen, at, uh, this field has a default value. And a default value for Booleans in Java is false. So assertions disabled false. And we have an assertion 1 to equal to 2. It will be assertion here, even those assertions disabled. This is so-called bad cycle. You can have that in your code. And if you have it in your code, you should really think about your design. And it's not on us to think about your design. You're providing a general purpose yeah. tool. Yeah, and coming back to our tools that we develop, you, you told me that we do something like this. We, we, yeah. we have a field, and we initialize this field in a static initializer. I just so, wanted to give a simple example. So if, if you follow the same what, what is done for assertions, we are going to have a default value for our prop array. And, and so the default value for arrays is null. So you're going to actually have a null pointer exception. Absolutely. We have, we have seen this in the early versions. And that's how we detected the bad cycles. And I put it a simple way to not confuse you from the very beginning. But what we learned is that we cannot rely on static initializers. So we have no guarantee that the static initializer is actually executed first. So um, what we need to do, or the solution is, that we need to rely on our own initializer. So we add another synthetic method. It's important, synthetic method. Nobody can see that on the API. We need another, we add another static synthetic method. We call it dollar chacoco init. And within the init method, we retrieve the Boolean um, array instance from the runtime if it's not already set. If it's already there, if it's already in the in the constant, in the static final Chakoko data, we don't have to retrieve it again. So basically, there's no performance penalty for that. And within every method, we don't use the field directly. We use the Chakoko init method, and the Chakoko init method, in any case, will return the instance, regardless whether the static initializer has been um, executed before. So that's simple. This is indeed simple, but Something bothers me on this slide. Uh, something, something looks strange. Anyone has any idea what's strange there? Exactly. Uh, so we have a final here. Well, but this works. I mean, we're creating the bytecode since years, and this works for many years. But, but let me remind you something. Let me cite one of the Bibles oh. in a Java world. Let me quote you a Java virtual machine specification. If you will read a chapter about uh, put static bytecode instruction, which assigns a value to a static fields, you will see something like this. If the static field is final, then put static instruction must occur in so-called CL init method of the current class. So it, it should occur actually in a static initializer of a current class. Otherwise, an illegal access error is thrown. And look, okay, you are sure. doing assignment outside of static initializer. Are you telling me the Java VM does not comply with the specification? Turns out that this was not checked for many years. And it simply worked. It simply worked like for, for eight years or something like this. And the check of this condition was, was added just recently in GDK9. 
and it's checked only for class files that are Java 9 class files. So quite recently, we started to fail due to this check, and we need, we need a better solution. So what we did, Mark? I mean, that's easy. That's pretty easy. I mean, we just remove the final. Uh, it's just a static field, then you're done, right? So we can do it for the classes, and everything is good. Yeah, pretty easy. But what about interfaces? You know, everything is in interfaces is static final. But look, in interfaces, we only have maybe at most a static initializer, but that's it in interfaces. Um, are you really a Java expert, Mark? Sure. What about Java 8? You, you can have default methods in interface. Yeah, now I remember and also static methods, right, right, right. We can have many more methods now in interfaces, so we really need to care about code coverage for interfaces now. Yeah. So, question here is, can we have exact the same problem of bad cycles within interfaces? So, the problem is, uh, if, if we can't use final, then we should put uh, static initializer and initialize our array here. Uh, but if there is a same problem of bad cycles with interfaces as with classes, then we already know that static initialization wouldn't work. So in order to answer on a question whether bad cycles are possible with interfaces or not, let's have a look on another Bible. Let's have a look on the Java language specification. Uh, more precisely on a chapter about initialization. So class or interface is initialized immediately before instance of class or interface is created or static method declared by class is invoked. Pretty simple, isn't it? Instance created, initialization. Static method called, initialization. OK, static field access. For, uh, third condition, but let's stay simple on two. This is pretty much enough for, for the rest of the talk. So another part of a statement is when classes initialize it, its super classes are initialized. That's exactly what we've seen uh, with example of bad cycles with classes. And any super interfaces that declare any default methods are initialized. Is it clear? So class initialize it, let's initialize super, class, super classes and super interfaces that have default methods. So let's try to build, knowing all this, let's try to build an uh, example of bad cycle with interfaces. We will need to trigger initialization. Either we create an instance of some interface or we call some static method on this interface. Now let's have some base interface. Within the base interface, we're going to have static initialization, which, as before with classes, simply creates an instance of a child and calls some method on it. And as we learned before, we need to have a default method within this interface. Otherwise, initialization of base class wouldn't happen. And we have a child. In the child, uh, in order to see how everything goes, uh, we can use two techniques. We have some output to the console to see the sequence of calls, uh, or we can simply throw some exceptions, and exceptions show us uh, the stack trace, so we can see from where what was called. So what we have here, we have base with static initializer, we have child uh, with static initializer, and uh, we see some, and we have some debug output. And if there is a bad cycle, we will see that exception will happen before we got a chance to print on console something, right? Sorry? No, you can. You can. This is you can. Inside, this, uh, sanity check pass it. This, this is a perfectly valid Java code. Uh, you can come back home, and this will perfectly compile. Um, the question is, what will be the sequence? What will happen first? Uh, will we print on the console first and then exception, which would mean that uh, static initialization of a child uh, happened before the initialization of a base, so before we call it a method fun, or vice versa? So who thinks that uh, there will be a bad cycle problem? Who thinks that method will be called before the static initialization? I think so. 
It should be like these classes, it's logical. Right, Mark? Do you think opposite? Yeah. Oh, we had a strong argument about that. Remember that when we developed it? We both tested it on both ends. Yeah, and the real answer is it depends. We tested, so Mark did a test of uh, GDK version before update 40, and uh, he actually realized that indeed we can have the same bad cycle problem. Uh, method of a class call it, uh, method of an interface call it before the static initialization of this interface. So we have the pretty much the same problem with interfaces as with classes. At the at exact same time, I've been in another country uh, sitting next to my laptop, and I was doing exactly the same test. And I've seen another sequence. Static initialization happened before the call of a method. What the fuck? And it turns out that because we throw an exception, we also got a GVM crash here. Pretty nice. Also, we tried, you remember, we have either a way to trigger initialization using the creation of an instance, or we can call a static method. And we tried this as well. And on exact same GDK version, we got exactly different behavior. So there was no, consist no, consist no consistency at all. There was crash. And we reported all this back to OpenGDK. This was not that hard, and has been fixed. Uh, the correct order according to specifications that static initialization of an interface should happen before you can call the method on this interface. Uh, so the implementation was finally aligned with, uh, with the specification. But unfortunately, as, uh, let's say, buggy versions already went out, uh, we need some solution for this. So what, what we do in Jokoko to overcome all this? OK, so um, what we do here, we do not rely on the static initializer, of course. So, uh, we do it initially, because at one point in time, the static initializer will be um, called of the interface. But the Jokoko init method we create for interfaces checks every time and if it's not initialized yet, if we are in the bad cycle, and I hope your application does not end up in the bad cycle all the time, um, as long as we are in the bad cycle, we still take the slow pass and request the Boolean array from the runtime. And I hope this does not happen so often. Yeah. OK. Um, that's probably enough with, uh, with all the magic of uh, getting the prop array except that on all of the slides we've showed so far, each time when we say accessing the job current time, we are putting three dots. So I want to ask you, Mark, how you actually, how we actually access the Jocko current time. And I want to ask this because uh, in, for example, OSGI environment or in application servers environments, it's pretty common practice to uh, separate uh, parts of your application on a different class loaders. And so you can have, for example, such a class loader that uh, gives, uh, for the classes loaded by this class loader, gives an access only to the Java base and to some classes of an application. But it doesn't give at all an access to anything else. So uh, here is a problem. I, I, I don't see how you can actually query org Jacoco package. Uh, you can use only classes from Java base. Right, right. This is a common scenario. So we've seen before that Jacoco runtime is added as a um, um, Java agent. And the classes within the Java agent, they go to the application class path of the JVM. And in many runtime environments, like um, web application server or OSGI runtime, there's no access from the application classes to the um, to the application class pass. They have their own means of class loading and they shield the application with the special class loaders like we've seen before uh, from like the application class pass. So we need a solution to get to the, um, to the runtime. And what we actually need to do is we can only rely on Java APIs. So we cannot use our own APIs. We cannot load any Chacoco class. So let's see how we can do this. Um, the trick here is uh, we are actually 
having a Java agent in place, and with the Java agent, we can retransform any class, not just your application classes. We can also retransform um, Java runtime classes, and we can, for example, add a field to an arbitrary Java runtime class. Here in this example, we took a Java util UUID, and to the Java util UUID, we simply add a new static field. And this field is created at runtime, at startup of the agent, and the field has the type object. It's simply an object, and it's our accessor to the runtime. An object, by the way, is a perfect API. You can do anything with object. Uh, object has like a nice method uh, we can call, and for this, first of all, we need to create our arguments. Um, so what we typically need, so the class knows its name, uh, the class knows the numbers of probes the class got during instrumentation, and we also have like a class ID, which is kind of a um, hash, to, so we can also, uh, we can, for example, in application servers, you might have different versions of a class with the same name, and, but they might have completely different control structures because they are different classes, and to differentiate them, uh, we also generate a class ID. So this is how the class communicates with the runtime. This is the arguments, and there's a nice method called equals where we can pass any object, and this is how we can communicate with the access object. Um, sorry, Mark, I, I don't understand something here. You need a Boolean array. Method equals returns a Boolean. Okay, right, right, right. We can't use the return. We, we ignore it for sure. But fortunately, um, object arrays are immutable in Java. Um, so we can use the argument array we passed in, and we put in the, um, the result into the argument array. So we can directly retrieve, for example, from the first slot, we can retrieve our Boolean array. So note here that on this pseudocode we see here, or it's actually code, um, we don't see any reference to any Chacoco APIs. It's pure Java lang APIs, nothing else. That's nice, that's nice. Um, and the last difficulty on which today we'd like to, to stop and uh, discuss is uh, a support of a new Java versions when class file format changes, when basically increment of uh, uh, class file version happens, uh, like this happened with uh, Java 9. So if I take a early access build of a Java compiler, uh, and I compile some source code, of course I'm gonna uh, get uh, a class file of the version of, of Java 9. And as it is early access build, uh, the library which we use for bytecode manipulation, the great library of, uh, 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 whose name is ISM, doesn't yet support this class file format. And if you will try to read uh, such a bytecode by, by this library, you are going to get illegal argument exception. And interesting fact here is uh, if exact same class you are going to give to the Java decompiler of quite some old version, this decompiler will perfectly, almost perfectly, be able to decompile it. As long as you don't use a features of a new class file. So basically, the Java decompiler will try to do his best job uh, and to not crash uh, as long as you don't have a new bytecode instructions that it doesn't understand. And this actually gave us an idea of how we can support Java 9 before the release of Java 9 and so before the release of ISM. The trick is pretty simple. Once we get uh, a bytes of a class, uh, if we need, uh, if we see the Java 9 bytecode, we can simply uh, change few bytes in and uh, and change the version from the 9 to 8. Then we read this by ISM. Uh, thankfully, there is no new bytecode instruction, so ISM perfectly processes this class. Uh, we do all the transformations that we need to do. Uh, we get the class back and we change the version from 8 to 9 back. So no one outside of us is going to see this trick. Um, this was the trick that, uh, that we needed for like, uh, 
a little bit more than a year to support Java 9. Nowadays, we don't need this trick. We, we simply upgrade it to the, to the new release of ISM that supports Java 9. And, and that's pretty much it. Right. Um, the point is that just um, the last weeks, we learned that the OpenJDK project will get a much more aggressive release cycle. So we will see two releases a year. And so we, I think we have the same problem again and again. And just three days ago on the OpenJDK mailing list, Mark Reynolds uh, proposed a new versioning scheme, which looks much more reasonable than the one which was proposed before. And we were wondering how is that related actually to class file versions? And um, I was asking this question just here at the conference yesterday to Mark Reynolds on Twitter. Um, so what does this mean to class file versions? Will we get new class file versions one or twice a year, once or twice a year, um, even if there's no semantical change or no update of the JVM specification? And Mark gave us a pretty clear answer, which was yes. So this will give um, tool vendors a hard job how we actually consume the new Java versions, uh, where we have no indication whether there was a semantical change um, in the class file format. So probably we will need to use this trick over and over again. OK. So that's it for today. We hope that you had fun, and we invite you to, to be involved. Feel free to join our, our community. Feel free to help others. Uh, feel free to answer questions now that you know all the tricky parts of uh, our implementation. Same on Stack Overflow. Feel free to join projects, contribute patches, report bugs, and etc. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, we, we're ready to answer. We, we're ready to chat with you. We will be very happy to talk about GVM, coverage, quality, whatever, whatever you like. So uh, the index into the probe array is the uh, line inside the method, right? So the first line of the method will be zero. No. No? no? It's, it's not uh, related to lines at all. As I explained to you, like, if you have a method like of 10 lines, and there's uh, uh, just a sequence of instructions, there will be only one probe at the very end of the, of the method. So the index of the method is an interesting question. So as I told you, we analyze the control structure and we, we create the, the probe positions. And um, doing this, this process is um, reproducible. So if we get the same class file, we get the same probes with some index. And we do this process twice, once at instrumentation. So at instrumentation time, we do the process and add the actual probes. And at analysis time, we do the same control flow uh, analysis again, and we get the exact same probe IDs, so we can actually understand the execution data. That's why it's very important that we are sure we're seeing the exact same class file at runtime as this analysis time. We cannot work with class files which have been changed or modified or recompiled, whatever, um, between execution and analysis. So rephrasing a little bit, the algorithm to insert probes is deterministic. You give the same input, you're going to get the same positions. And basically, at the time of creation of a prop, we increment a counter. And this is an idea of a prop. It's and not a line. Kakoko also works if you don't have um, debug information at all. If there's no line numbers, you will also get perfect branch coverage. Uh, the, the question is, uh, e, um, if, if you run two methods concurrently, do they share the uh, space of indexes into the probe array or not? No. Um, no. The, oh. It's one probe array per class. But, of course, each probe has a unique um, ID within the oh. class. So uh, it works in, in the concurrent world because uh, concurrent updates are only updated to the same value, right? So, yes. I, I mean, you're right. Okay. You're just writing into the array without any kind of uh, synchronization. Or so, if so there's the, no synchronization going on. So the only point here is... Um, no, you're lying because there, <laughs> there is a synchronization. Okay. So, we get a probe array. There is no concurrency problem because uh, we don't need to read the current value. We, we do not increment. We, we always, 
every single thread that is executing instrumented code is going to write exact same value. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, the IDs are unique. So They're unique, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, one, uh, and, and all IDs are unique. Yeah, thank and you. The only point of a synchronization is, uh, and actually at the runtime point, when, when we request a proper array from the runtime. Because we need to put all the arrays into the single place uh, later on to be able to save all them on a disk. So here we have a map, and on this map we do a synchronization. But this happens only once uh, we need to initialize proper array. So basically, we pay a cost of a synchronization once per class initialization. Does this make sense? Yeah, thanks. Еще вопросы, господа? So we will be out there in the discussion area, so please feel free for in-deep technical discussions. Thank you.